welcome, welcome everybody. Here we are, our regular Sunday night. We're here an hour early because it's Christmas time, so we brought a present tonight. <laughs> we have guest uh, Rissa Miller, um, and we are going to be talking about um, everything Christmas. So we are, as you know, Global Strangeness, uh, three strangers brought together by the love of everything spooky and um, creepy. Um, so it's myself, Deborah, Scott, and Jeremy. And like I said this week, we're having an extra, extra special guest, and we're going to be talking about all the wonders of Christmas, the <laughs> rum and eggnog, Christmas cookies, all that fun stuff, and monsters. What would it be without some monsters? And no, we're not talking about your relatives, although some of those might make an appearance. <laughs> That's probably scarier than anything. So now, welcome, De welcome, Rissa. De <laughs> Deborah, those are in-laws. Those are not my family. Those are in-laws. There's a difference. <laughs> Well, I'm single, so I'm probably the only one that would be safe to make a joke like that. You're in trouble now. <laughs> so. Oh, my, my in-laws don't watch my stuff, so I'm good. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's get into it. And surprisingly, Christmas has a whole lot of, mm -hmm. you're either guilting your kids with, you know, you better be good or Santa won't bring you presents, or you can terrify the crap out of them with all the monsters, because there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of cryptids, a lot of uh, Christmas spooks. So me because I don't know all of them. So, Rissa, I'm, I'm going to count on you um, to um, let me know about all of these guys. Absolutely my pleasure, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Trust me. Yeah. My show, you. my show got, your episode of my show got great reception. So, I had to have you on here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, where would you like to begin in the pantheon of Christmas monsters tonight? Well, I mean, Scott, I think we should start with the beginnings of what formed Christmas eventually. Am I wrong? Okay, yeah, jump through the history. Back sure, to some Saturnalia a, or wherever you want to go. We can do a quick, a quick history. So um, Christmas is really about the winter solstice, which is Wednesday night, December 21st this year. And it is actually the um, longest night and shortest day of the year. So not that long ago in um, human history, that was a really big deal because our societies were ruled by agriculture when when you could grow, when you could harvest and what the weather looked like outside. And um, nowadays we have, you know, electronic stars like Jeremy and uh, Zoom and computers and HVAC to keep us warm or cool. But that wasn't the case a long, or not even that long ago, really. And um, winter solstice was the moment when they knew that the cold season was going to turn and the days would get longer again. So it was very relevant to humanity uh, for that reason. And it was always celebrated. Now, there are lots of ways that it was celebrated. And um, some of them were in Quaker and style. Scott, you mentioned Saturnalia. That was a Roman holiday. And uh, we are actually in what was the traditional time for Saturnalia right now. Um, it would have started on December 17th. And it went for a few weeks. And it was like a real party. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's like no other way to describe it. It was a real party, a real big party. And it's... Uh, it just didn't stop. It went on and on and on. And uh, when I say party, I mean everything you can think of that is celebratory. Um, drinking, feasting, orgies, gambling, all kinds of just general uh, 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 wildness, uh, public wildness. And that was the Roman way to do these things. And um, that was one way that winter solstice was celebrated. But north of that, um, the celebration was still a bit more um, lively than what it became over time. Um, that would have been Yule. And in the northern parts of Europe, Yule was celebrated around the winter solstice for not quite as long as Saturnalia, but um, long, several days and several nights. And it was over again that longest night of the year. It is where we get the Yule log tradition and the Yule boar. Um, the Yule boar is an interesting story. That's what gives us uh, one of our traditions that we still celebrate with today. And uh, the Yule boar was a pig and it was part of the Yule celebration. It would be paraded through the streets 
and everybody would try to touch it. They would just sort of scramble to reach out and touch this pig as it was paraded by. And if you got to touch the Yule boar, you would make a promise, a resolution, if you will, that you were going to be a better person or you were going to work harder, you were going to be more honest or do better at school or whatever the case might have been. And uh, that tradition gave, gave us what we now think of as New Year's resolutions. So, I mean, or, New Year's, was, or New Year's ahead. lies. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, there's a little bit of a difference, though. Back then, if you didn't work harder, you might starve over the winter. So uh, there was a little bit more at stake uh, back in those days than today when we say, like, I'm going to work out more. Mm, maybe. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. <laughs> I've said uh, that yeah. one a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't work but, out. But yeah, but back then, if you said, I'm going to do better on my farm, um, it might mean life or death. So... So that said, the Yule boar was, of course, slaughtered and eaten afterwards, um, which, you know, might have been the beginnings of the Christmas ham that so many people still celebrate with today. Wasn't so the head the main, like, delicacy, though? It was. It was. <laughs> the whole pig was eaten. They, they yeah. wasted nothing. <laughs> they wasted no part of that animal, uh, especially that particular one, because it was so lucky to get a piece of it. So it, you were very fortunate if you got to get a piece of the, the village's Yule boar. Not very so, lucky for the pig, though. <laughs> not very lucky for the pig. No, not so much. I don't know if the pig felt honored by that position. <laughs> so, so as we're getting into it, you're, are you going into like uh, Yule through the Nordic mythologies next? I wasn't going to go into that too much. Um, but I mean, if you want to jump in. Well, we had... Uh, <laughs> So our last guest episode, we had a little dispute. It was mainly mm -hmm. Deborah. She was enraged. That, uh, <laughs> have you ever heard the mushroom Santa Claus as a mushroom history with the reindeer eat the an Amanita muscaria? Do you know, I have to admit, I have not heard that one. Okay, well, yeah, it basically brings it down to the Sherpas would wear the red and the white coats. And, Got um, it. The Amanita muscaria looks like Santa Claus and the reindeer and everything was tied in. And we were just trying to help disprove that theory. For I, I've literally never heard that theory. Is my understanding that Santa and the reindeer is something, a construct from the 19, early 1900s that was thought up by, uh, by both um, a children's book author and then perpetuated by the Coca-Cola company. Yeah. So um, that is the history that I know. I mean, I'm always willing to be educated, but that is the history I know of Santa and the reindeer. Now, there definitely are uh, cultures and traditions that had reindeer yeah. and people who wore red coats. But um, yeah, I, I have a, a fantastic uh, villain that had a sleigh pulled by reindeer, but he's nothing to do with Santa. I mean, Santa's even kind of weakly something to do with the actual St. Nicholas. So, well, yeah, can you get into like the Christ child and uh, Chris Kringle and how Bell's Nickel and all them got tied in together? Oh, gosh, that, that was a mouthful. That's a whole <laughs> lot of history. You just you just crammed in there. OK, so um, we're still on Yule. Let's let's go back. Okay. there. So, um, so God, we, we don't, don't put. Don't, don't touch all the Yule hog in your mouth at once, man. Come on. <laughs> so, all right. So we're back at Yule. And um, so Christianity comes along. And these cultures are really used to, they're accustomed to their own celebrations. They like them. You know, this is the end of the harvest season. This is a great celebration. It's a, a custom that becomes centuries old. And Christianity comes along and Pope Julius decides that um, it's time to uh, take winter solstice and make it into a Christian holiday. Now, there's a lot of debate among scholars about when uh, Jesus the Christ child was actually born. Many people do not think it has anything to do with December. Uh, a lot of both scientists and historians actually believe that he was born in March and um I have not dug deeply into that research, but I know they do things like um, where the star positions were, and they check that against uh, the Bible and then the history of where the stars actually were to figure out when he was born. So, um, well, isn't that either... that's that's an interesting thing too, right? Because like the winter solstice, you have the star reaches its absolute lowest point, 
where it dies on the crux and then it rises again in three days which kind of more of an easter thing not a christmas it is it is and that's why so many scholars don't think that he was born in december at all um but they think that what happened was the catholic church said let's put this holiday here and get rid of this wild solstice party well i am here to tell you this was not a popular idea among (laughs) the public um it it did not catch on it was called christ mass and uh, the idea was that instead of partying in the street for days at a time you were going to go to church and pray people did not embrace this quickly this was not something that um any any part of Europe immediately embraced. It took a long time, and I mean centuries, to catch on. And, well, um, go sit in a boring church versus having an orgy. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> that's not even a choice. <laughs> so, well, you know, that's that's where people were with that. Um, everybody agreed with what you just said. Uh, they they were like, we've we've been all, we've always done this. I don't know why we should change, and I'm not gonna. So, um, I mean, but Europe was always torn by religious wars. It was you know, almost accustomed to be in a religious war in some part of Europe at any time. So eventually, of course, Catholicism and Christianity take over and people start to become more conservative. And uh, by the time we get to the Protestant Reformation, people are real conservative. And uh, they they decide, uh, Protestants, Puritans, Quakers, that there's not going to be a Christmas anymore at all. Done. Uh, it's too wild. It's too pagan. It's too uh, just, you know, <laughs> too fun. They don't want it. And I, even to the point when America, when American colonists arrived here, Christmas was actually illegal. Like if you yep. were found celebrating Christmas, you would be arrested, especially in New England. So uh, that was that was a thing. That was a reality. And, and that's that's why we have minced meat pies instead of. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas pies. And, well, and like they said in Eurotrip, Scott, all the people who couldn't handle the awesome fun parties of Europe went to America. Yeah. Uh, kind well, of the opposite not, of that. Yeah, I, I say it's it that's that's open for debate. But um, you know, the American South actually embraced Christmas before a lot of the northern uh, colonies. And um, as more Germans arrived, they actually really liked Christmas. Uh, so even think like Hessian soldiers that came during the revolution, they brought their Christmas customs with them. And those that stayed here, uh, who, who were either stayed as prisoners or just stayed, they also uh, decided that they were going to have Christmas. And it didn't really matter what the Quakers wanted or what the Puritans wanted. So all of that said, all along, they did have these customs in Europe where there would be a figure that would reward good children, and he would often be accompanied by a, a second figure who uh, took care of the less than well-behaved. And um, that said, <laughs> let's talk for a second, if you, if you will, about the figure of St. Nicholas. So the actual St. Nicholas was a real guy. And um, he was Greek in in what we now think of as Turkey. But um, like I said, those countries were regularly at war uh, historically, and the borders changed a lot. But um, we'll just say that he was Mediterranean. And that uh, background of growing up in a Catholic background, he was just a really good guy, they say. His family was very rich and his parents died young. He used his fortune to help others. He was like a genuinely good person. Now, there are some kind of um, strange stories attached to Nicholas. Uh, The first um, might be an origin of Christmas stockings. Might be. Uh, They say that he was walking down the street and through a window heard a father and his three daughters uh, talking about how the women did not have dowries. So historically, a woman had to have money or goods in order to purchase a good marriage. So that was what a dowry was. You probably already know that, but just in case somebody listening doesn't, um, a dowry was essential to purchase a quality marriage for your daughter. Um, you had to have either cash or sheep or land or some, some kind of goods to marry your daughter off. Um, just having a nice daughter was not good enough back in the day. So Let me marry my wife for nothing. Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> so these three girls were very poor. They did not have dowries and they were lamenting that they would not be able to purchase a good marriage. And their father was also very disappointed. Now, if a woman did not have a dowry, she could become a servant or a slave or a prostitute, but she didn't have much of a future. So Nicholas, for whatever reason, is eavesdropping in the window, which is, I have questions, but I mean, anyway, <laughs> um, he hears this story and he's like, I'm going to solve their problem. He's got tons of money. So he comes back under cover of night and throws gold in the window. Miraculously, there is some kind of, of I guess, magic. Um, the girls have hung their socks by the window to dry and the gold fills their socks. Some people believe this is the beginning of the Christmas stocking. Now, are there other possible origins? Absolutely. But it is a sweet and lovely story, and it gives St. Nicholas um, a little bit of that kindness that you, you want in your Christmas hero. So the other one is the, uh, <laughs> the traditional Christmas zombie story, which who could celebrate without it, right? And exactly. so see you know what i'm saying so again saint nicholas is before he's sainted he's cruising around doing his good deeds and he walks into a butcher shop and the butcher says oh i have the best thing you're you're going to love it it's it's just an exquisite piece of meat and in a pickling barrel he has uh, some meat packed and um it turns out saint nicholas is uh perhaps clairvoyant i'm not sure and he says this is not an animal. This is human meat. These are three boys that you've killed and butchered. Now, <laughs> through a magic, a magical force, once again, St. Nicholas is able to resurrect the boys from the dead, put them back together after they've been butchered and pickled, and uh, send them on their way home. Um, you can even find paintings of this, and uh, they're, they're quite something. So, um, do you hang glass pickles on your tree? Do you play the pickle game at all? I do, but that's actually not historically related to this. Yeah, no, um, the story's a little different. Santa Claus still saves the day, but... Right, right. Um, so uh, this is the beginning, though, of the anti-Santa, of the monster story. Because at that moment, St. Uh, Nicholas looks to the butcher and says, you, you will have to pay for your crimes. You will have to um serve me um later in your life i will come back for you and um, legend has it that he does and he becomes one of the anti-santas that walks beside saint nicholas um to this day but um but yeah um the, the traditional christmas zombie story is is a heartwarming one i guess and uh it be I, the, a lot of people have told tried to tell me this is where the christmas pickle story came from but that i know it's not actually that way um so starting from there actually you know what can i tell you one, one or two more little strange details about saint nicholas well we're not called global strangers for nothing <laughs> Perfect. As long as we're um, eating nasty goo from dead people. That's it. That's where we're going. <laughs> that's where we're going. So of course he he you know he becomes a bishop and then he's sainted. He passes away, and he is buried in 300 A.D.s, 300s A.D., 300s A.D. And um, of course his tomb oozes goo. Uh, some people call it manna. Some people uh, say it was just like a magical goo. <clears throat> And uh, apparently folks would come from miles around to collect the oozing goo from Nicholas's <laughs> tomb and consume it, smear it on their bodies, smear it on their children, because it was uh, it had a, a healing property. Allegedly, it, it could fix any problem that you had. Uh, and of course, you know, people want their problems fixed easily, right? So the, well, why not line up to get the goo from his tomb? Some Italian sailors thought, you know what, let's take him. Let's take him and um, sell him off because if he's got magic, we want to profit on it. So they did. Uh, they they exhumed him from his tomb and they sold him off uh, by dismembering his body and putting him in pieces. Um, I believe there are some pieces in America. Uh, last I checked, there was some in Annandale, Virginia. Um, there is a piece of St. Nicholas that exists in a museum in Canada. And he's basically scattered throughout the world. So his bones are still around. I, I don't think all of them at this point, but um, 
parts of St. Nicholas still exist in this world, and they're in the hands of collectors and museums scattered across the globe. Now, my understanding is they no longer ooze goo. I guess they had to all be together for that. No, well, the, number the magic one, was broken. Yeah, the magic number, was broken. No, number one, goddamn Canadians keep it in the museum showing everybody. Well, we're supposed and to have multiple. <laughs> we like to share. We're fine, okay? <laughs> and, and two, that should be a damn TV show trying to find all the bones of St. Nick to put together to save Christmas. I think the History yes. Channel did... I think the History Channel did do an hour long special on it. Did no, they really? I think so. Yeah. No, no. Oh, I, I heard. For that. I heard that they actually went and tried to steal Nicholas back, and they didn't know if uh, uh, it was the real body or not. I well, imagine uh, it would be somewhat hard to verify right now without yeah. Colonauts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, carbon dating one, but two, they should take screw. screw Disney Plus, they should take the Santa Claus show and the National Treasure show and combine them into this. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> when did that happen? That was kind of recently, right? In the 1900s when they stole it? Was it was not the 1900s. Hang Nin on. I have, I have the date here um, in my notes. Hang on. It was in 1087. 1087? Huh, maybe I'm watching something else. <laughs> 1087. He has been privately owned uh, for all of that time. <laughs> I wonder how much a piece of Santa goes for. That's what I was just I thinking. Imagine, like, yeah, I imagine it's a salty fee. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't. Um, I can't quite picture the value of a piece of Saint Nicholas, especially um, with the uh, folkloric value of that now. You know, it's, imagine it's how many those, duds you're getting. It's one of the. It's one of those black market auctions that you have to have like a special invite to go to. Probably. I've never heard of Tiffany's or a place, or I'm sorry, what, what are some of the auction houses? Tiffany's is a jewelry uh, place. South of B and wherever the hell it's called. That's it. Yeah. That's what I was thinking yeah. of. Yeah, Southern I can't B, yeah. imagine them selling him off there. It sounds, I well, think they're too classy. Not during their main auctions, but you know, their backroom auctions, you never know. Right. Private collectors. Exactly. The king, the kingpins of the world, and the Doctor Evils. Those are the ones they should televise. That's that's what they, everyone wants to actually see. <laughs> uh, you would probably get an amazing amount of viewers for something like that. Yeah, so. probably. I mean, like, all the cops would be watching. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Saint Nicholas was um, also he was the protector of children, patron saint of children. But he's also the patron saint of wolves sailors, pawnbrokers, butchers, prostitutes, thieves, and New York City. So well that's well that's where the ho 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 came from. I guess so. <laughs> so yeah, I, I always thought that was an interesting collection of uh things to be the patron saint for. And um but yeah Ca so Catholics make saints everything. There's a saint of the internet. So I, I somebody told me that they were trying to get through a uh a saint of paranormal investigators and i was like you let they, me know when that happens because they, <laughs> they, they should they yeah. should it'd be it'd be what's his name um the guy who tried to prove harry houdini wrong all the time uh arthur Conan doyle it'd be him <laughs> well i don't know deborah you're catholic right maybe i'm in the running you i don't just know gotta got get in there. This one. <laughs> i told you during our demons episode two thousand bucks you i mean learn your exorcism and and who's who who the hell's the saint of the internet? Ron Jeremy? I can look it no. up. Well, they're actually trying to give it to a kid who died, but there oh, was wow. like an old saint. Now you threw my jokes, god damn it. <laughs> saint of the internet. Yeah, have you ever heard of Hochelaga? He does a lot no. of historical uh little 10 minute mm. YouTube videos. He's got some really good really good stuff. I so can't say cool. I've them, but... Yeah, so I'll have to check it out. So shall we jump in while you, uh, while you search that out and start talking about uh, the monsters? Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. All right. I got it right here, though. It's St. Isodor of yeah. Cervelle, which I'm sure I definitely fucked up. Cervelle, you, you mean? Go. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. 
All right. So since we're already talking about St. Nicholas and uh, the butcher, let's just go with that monster to start. So um, in France, the Christmas monster is La, Pierre, La Pierre Futard, and that directly translates to Father Whipper or the Whipping Father. And this is the butcher. This is the guy. So um, his, or his origin story dates back as far as the 1100s. And uh, this is the man who captured the boys and chopped them up. And um, remember, there was no refrigeration. So meat had to be salted, smoked, cured. Things were pickled to preserve them. Uh, so it, that's, that's how that part of the story um, fits in. So uh, the legend has it that this is one of the most vicious of the Christmas monsters. I mean, he doesn't get nearly as much press as Krampus. Yeah. But yeah, the uh, father whipper not only will whip children, but he's also a cannibal. If they're really bad, he's going to cut them up and eat them. And um, he does offer them to other people as his best meat, they say. So he always is uh, accompanying St. Nicholas in parts of France. And he's dressed in traditional black. He's kind of got a dirty face, long sort of scraggly beard. And they say that he's quite fierce to, to see. He comes on December 5th and 6th, uh, the eve of St. Nicholas Feast and the day of St. Nicholas Feast, just like Krampus and the Belsnickel, that's their day as well. And he is um, also seen in Belgium. He did gain some traction in the United States in the 1920s and 30s in New York City area. They called him Father Flog. And uh, instead of just dismembering the kids and eating them, they said if your child was a liar, he would cut out their tongue. But if your kid was just bad, he, he would just whip them. But um, to this day, well, I mean, there is. Go ahead. I mean, beef tongue tastes pretty good. So kid tongue, who knows? <laughs> I couldn't tell you. That's that's not my, my favorite dish. However, you're gonna there need is a lot a for burritos. Right? <laughs> uh, now, there is still a restaurant in France called La Pierre Futard. They say they serve traditional classic French fare. So I'm not sure what's really on the menu there, but uh, I did think that was an interesting little tidbit that somebody would name their restaurant after a uh, folkloric figure that cuts up uh, and pickles children. So he's he's more similar to like Black Pete, huh? Kind of. Not. He's a little scarier, I think. No, less you... racist and scarier. What do you? That's that's what I was going with. That they're trying to like shut down Black Pete. Yeah, you want to talk about the Zirate Fiats? Well, it's just weird, right? Because like his his face is black because he goes down the chimney. Oh, so that's it's... not the origin of that. His face is black is because he's Spanish. He's Moorish. Now remember, the Netherlands and Spain warred for years. They um, they were not friendly, and so when the figure was originally thought of, they used their enemy's likeness to create the Zoate Piet. and. Um, that's actually why uh, people now think it's such a hideously racist figure. So the sooty piet that you're talking about is a fairly new um, version of this character, and um, yeah, I'm I'm talking about the one from New York, and that like that's um, his story, like that's where they're or no, not New York and Pennsylvania Dutch. They're trying to cancel him, and uh, his that's, face yeah. is black because he's going down the chimney. Which right, that, seems... that's the Bell Snickel. Yeah, that's Bell Snickel's Pennsylvania Dutch. I grew up in that area. I'm very familiar with Bell Snickel. What part? Um, um, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, I know York. Mm -hmm. oh. Harrisburg, yeah, Westchester. Just... Oh, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, my, my brother still lives in the Westchester area. So. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so the, the Piet that you're talking about, the Black Peter, that is a uh, figure from the Netherlands. He's Dutch. And um, the UN has actually spoken out against him, um, as well as Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, the International Librarians Association. Uh, a lot of people are saying that the black-faced uh, Zuarte Piet, um, I wish I did have a picture to share with you or a screen share. That would be great to show you. Um, he, again, comes on the Feast of St. Nicholas Day, but um, 
The story for Zoatepia is that he is Moorish, he is Spanish, dark skinned. And if the actor doesn't look like that, they literally blackface, not dirty face, not sooty face, but black face. And um, they use a black haired curly wig. And they say that uh, to punish the children, Zoate Piet, what he does is to put the children in his bag and take them to Spain for a year to punish them. And I'm like, okay, sign me up. <laughs> I'd like to go to Spain for a year. But um... <laughs> it's like, punch me, daddy, punch me. Uh, that sounds great. Oh, I was really bad. Take me to Spain. Um, especially because the Zoate Piet lives on the Mediterranean coast. So um, terrible punishment for these kids. But um, there are people in the area where this is a tradition that um, absolutely hate it and want it to become the sooty piet. Or they also are trying to paint his face gold or blue instead. And then there are other people who want to keep the tradition. And there have been street riots over yeah. this over this figure. I mean, violent street riots where there were fires and cars overturned and stores, uh, store glass windows destroyed. I mean, people are really serious about the Zorte Piet in this area. Um, it is an interesting uh, note that um, it is actually illegal now to do the, uh, the uh, black-faced Piet. But uh, I think people still do. I think it's one of those traditions that among some people will die hard. And uh, when you when you Google it and you look, um, it, it does look a bit racist. Um, and uh, the blue and the gold and the sooty ones, they don't look anything like the the older one with the true black face. Um, but no, I, I definitely encourage you to look at it and check it out. Um, mm -hmm. Draw your own conclusion, of course. But yeah, I don't feel like his punishment is at all on par with the whipping father. <laughs> um, <laughs> not anything at all <laughs> like uh, being dismembered and eaten. Um, instead, just being taken <laughs> to Spain for a year. So Wait yeah. a minute. Blue and gold. Isn't that that whole dress thing that happened on Facebook during COVID? Like, is the dress blue? Is it gold? Yes. They, somebody I tried to put that. I just saw that again recently. <laughs> I missed yeah. that. Like, what was that about? Oh, like it was a picture of a dress, and like I swear to God, every time you saw it, it was a different color. Was somebody hmm. photoshopping it? Probably, but I mean, it's just, it was just, it was the biggest thing on Facebook for a long time. Everybody <laughs> sees different colors just according to how we see it. It became, it, right. it's Facebook, so everybody's idiots. So it became yeah. the biggest like argument in the world. Well, that makes sense. That we tracks. don't have enough in the world to talk about. So we talk about these things. <laughs> so, what color is the dress? <laughs> well, Scott, Actually, I you think, asked I th about. Go ahead, Jeremy. I was say I think COVID ended that, but the the dress thing ended when COVID started. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Scott has asked a few times about Bell Snickel, and obviously, uh, you know, since you are from this part of PA, um, perhaps it is a beloved figure for you. So we go there next, since we're still in the early Christmas monsters that come on the fifth and sixth. Yeah, sure. Go cert all of them. Awesome. Yeah, Dwight will be happy. Dwight, Dwight will be happy. <laughs> so Belsnickel's story actually begins in Europe, and it begins with Neck Ruprecht. And I, I was lucky enough just this past weekend to hear a um, scholar talk about the origin story of Belsnickel and to, uh, to get to meet a Belsnickel um, in person. So I, uh, I, it was fun. And... Um, so Neck Ruprecht was a German Christmas monster, and um, he accompanied St. Nicholas on the 5th and 6th, traditionally. He always wore a Trappist monk robe, and he carried a bag of ashes. Now, if your child was bad, Neck Ruprecht would beat your child with the bag of ashes. Somebody asked me if that's so it didn't leave a mark. I, I don't know. Um, I've never beaten someone with a bag of ashes. I, I, I couldn't tell you. I imagine well, it would leave a totally different mark than a whip or switches. But Hey, kids, um, come here. Yeah, <laughs> I just don't know. I can't answer that question, but it is an interesting point. So uh, what Neck Ruprecht would do, we'd go into a house and tell, ask the children, you know, how have you been doing with your studies? Do you know your prayers? And if they were good he would leave apples or nuts or some small treats. Now, historically, remember, those things are a big deal. 
um, fruit was a, a really big treat. And if you were anywhere south in Europe, you might be able to get an orange or citrus. That was super exotic and really fancy gift back in the day. Even 100, 150 years ago, an orange was a, a big gift unless you lived somewhere that they grew. So um, if a child was really bad, though, um, he beat them with the bag of ashes and left us a birch switch so that their family could continue to beat them through the year. Uh, I, I suppose if they deserve it. And other, keeps on giving. <laughs> well, you know, other um, stories around Nick Ruprecht were that he was accompanied by dark fay, the same kind of dark fay that might have accompanied Odin on the wild ride or um, in Austrian lore. He worked in concert with Krampus. He would arrive before Krampus to scout out the really bad kids and the really bad kids would go to Krampus. And the kind of bad kids are sort of like the just annoying kids would be um, handled by Nick Ruprecht. So this figure came across the ocean with the Pennsylvania Dutch. The Pennsylvania Dutch were German. It's Pennsylvania Deutsch, like German was the yeah. word and um, they, they spoke a, a variety of German, they still do. And the Belsnickel was the monster that sort of evolved uh, from that culture. So Belsnickel arrives on the fifth or sixth. Um, the, the folks I, I heard speak the other day say that in um, parts of Pennsylvania, he can arrive anytime between the fifth and the 25th now. I guess he, he's gotten a little more laid back maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, or maybe he just has so All many that children. Tracking. Yeah, he has so <laughs> many children to punish that perhaps he needs more than one night. I don't know. Oh, but, in this day and age of YouTube, yeah, he's a lot of children to punish. Yeah, he's got a lot. <laughs> he's got a lot on his hands these days. Uh, Take I my two, please. I also recently learned that uh, he has his own sleigh pulled by eight cows in Pennsylvania Dutch country. And uh, that was new on me. I had not heard that book, that the story had evolved, that he, he, he has now gotten his own sleigh. He no longer accompanies St. Nicholas. He, he comes on his own. Um, and his sleigh is pulled by eight cows. Now, they don't fly through the air. They do skim along the ground. But... Um, I somehow that seems perfect for the culture where uh, the Belsnickel is. So he um, again, he carries candy or fruit or nuts for good children or maybe even small gifts. And he carries birch switches, whips and chains now for the bad kids. So, you know, he's arrived because he always taps on the window with the end of his whip, like tap, tap, tap. And, uh, you know, to open the door for Belsnickel. I mean, if you want to, I guess. Um, and he will still quiz the kids, just like Nick Ruprecht used to. He will ask a question. Um, now he's evolved into asking math questions. And <laughs> um, yeah, uh, apparently it's like a whole like uh, quiz that he gives now. It, it's like math and English and uh they still have to recite a prayer. I was just like, I would be so stressed out if I were a child and I knew this monster was coming to <laughs> inflict all of these quizzes on me and uh, right before bed, no less. Don't but, you think that um, takes kind of the fun away from it? Um, the fact that you can get out of being beaten? By well, no, I mean, work. come on. It's, <laughs> let's, let's get real. All these things were a big Christmas parade and the teenagers would get to get drunk and whip some kids that were in their preteens and everybody would have a good time. <laughs> well, back in the day, and you can still, there's still bell snickling that goes on. I just haven't and gotten Krampus that Krampus knock. Yet. Have you, have you yes. been to a Krampus knock? I have. Not in Germany, here in America. But yeah. Yes. Oh, it gets great. Like Austria, they don't even wear the horns because it gets so <laughs> like, so insane. I would no, love I, to go. I've not been to Austria, but that sounds it sounds like it must be really intense. So yeah, uh, the Belsnickel got a lot of press um, not too long ago when Dwight from The Office dressed up as him, and uh, exactly. he became much more famous all of a sudden. And Belsnickeling got popular again. Um, it was reported as far from Pennsylvania as Brazil that um, young men were dressing up and bell snickling in large groups going down the street dressed in like their tatty rags and faux fur carrying whips and chains and bells. 
Very so, little um, faux fur, though, because it's like 90 degrees in Brazil. Right? <laughs> when I thought of all of the Christmas monsters to pick up on yeah. I mean, Brazil, you go with the bell snickel, and because uh, he traditionally wears pelts of fur. Uh, just just sounds like a fun s and party. Uh, it, it's, it's not unlike that, from my understanding, although it involves children, not adults. But um, now, I've never kids, watched The Office. Is, has everybody else seen that? Oh, dude! I, will listen I mean, to it on YouTube. You yeah. Watch, watch that episode at least, because between that and Dwight putting in Trans Siberian Orchestra on the freaking stereo and saying "This is Christmas music," like <laughs> that's the that's the two best scenes ever in the Office. But but yeah. So the other interesting um, piece about the Bell Snickel is even if the kids are really good and they answer his questions correctly, he will throw um, the food on the floor for them, always on the floor. But if they're too <laughs> eager and they rush to get their candy and treats, he'll beat them anyway for, for being too eager. I respect he's the that only hustle. One, yeah, he's the only one of the monsters that does that. That's yeah. hustle. I respect it. <laughs> <laughs> my, um, my, my new understanding is that in the Pennsylvania Dutch community now, um, one of the other things Belsnickel does is sometimes he just comes, if the children leave their shoes out, um, he will come and either leave sticks in their shoes or candy and treats if they're good. So if uh, the day after Bell Snickle, you find your shoes full of a bunch of uh, broken sticks, you know that um, you need to do better next time. See, does this tie in? That's like something I've always wondered, right? Does it tie in? Right. Like you have the wooden clogs, you have stockings, yep. Yep. the Yule lads, the present is put by the shoes. Like yep. how... <laughs> I, I it's know all, it's America definitely sort of all, it's melded definitely it all related. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely all related. And um, even as it spread through Europe and everybody sort of, um, it's like a whisper down the lane. Do you mm -hmm. know the game whisper down the lane where you have a row of people and you telephone. start? <laughs> yeah, just like telephone. Oh, you mean, I was going to say the telephone game, yeah. Yes, just like I that. Mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's it, how it would be between town to town to town, I guess. Yeah, and so the, the the legends change slightly. They they alter, they evolve, but they definitely are all related. They definitely all tie together. Had, had do you ever listened to the Weird Christmas podcast? Do you know Craig Kringle? What? No, I've never heard of it until just this very moment. But I'm grabbing a pen to write it down. You should. He'll probably <laughs> interview you. He's done. Uh, have you ever read the old old magic of Christmas? No, I I have seen that book. I have yeah, read a lot she's, of books, but <laughs> he started out collecting all the old um, Christmas postcards. Yes, I then, have a bunch too. Yeah, he was putting them on Tumblr, and then he started a uh, started a podcast like seven years ago or something. But you'd probably probably get a kick out of it he does short stories every year where there's a winner oh that's and, great that, yeah, yeah but there's so many wonderful new christmas ghost stories that are are being produced and yeah, um about time. yeah I, uh, yeah i think it's great so yeah check it out he's I probably packed will. this year but i don't know oh, christmas sure. in july <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i mean i I think that the more these stories are circulated, the better. It keeps the history alive. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I'm, trying to I'm trying to remember if there are any other monsters that come that early in the month. Because I think most of the rest of them, they come later. They come during the 12 days of Christmas, between Christmas and Epiphany. They have yeah. a... What about the ones that come... Like, don't the Nisa and the Thompson come in March? What's the one in November, like Martin's Day? Oh, yeah. I, I don't actually count that as one of the Christmas monsters. And okay. um, the niece come with Lucia. That's in December. Okay. Well, they can come with Lucia. I mean, Martin's... Lucia is an interesting story. I guess chronologically, she's next. Um, so uh, does everybody know Lucy Longnight? Perkta? A little bit. No, not Perkta. Lucy. No. Mm. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. I, I've got a new one for you. Yeah. Um, so Lucia uh, was a girl in Italy and she was a sweet woman. And um, 
she prayed to God that if he would save her mother, she would devote herself to serving humanity the rest of her life. And her mother recovered from a great illness. So Lucia kept her word. And um, she devoted herself tirelessly to helping others, to feeding the hungry, helping the poor, helping the sick. But she was still a very beautiful woman. And um, one of her suitors decided that uh, if he couldn't have her, nobody else would either. And he ran her through the throat with a sword. Hmm. So it's a way to go, I suppose. And so from that point... I'm, I'm looking for my notes because I want to tell you the year. Uh, from that point, Lucia, um, she was sainted and she became Saint Lucia. And uh, that was in, here she is. Three hundred and ten AD. So this is one of those whisper down the lane effects. So she was Saint Lucia the Luminous. And as people told her story, she got confused with someone else. She got confused with Lucifer, the light bringer, because in different languages, Lucia and Lucifer sound very similar. And the story became distorted as it traveled across Europe. And the story became Lucy Long Night. The night of her death was December 13th. So it became that on December 13th, remember 13 is one of those numbers, right? And uh, that's, that's another whole story right there. But um, on December 13th, it would be Lucy Long Night. And on that night, Lucia would return and uh, wreak havoc on the countryside. You would just hope that she didn't come to your house because her shriek alone could break the walls down of your home. She could also communicate with animals. And uh, apparently she would get them to turn on you, which in an agricultural society is kind of a big deal. I mean, think how much damage that many animals could do to your property and home if you're a farmer. So there, there was a terrifying night for people who believed in Lucy. And it, it was just a distortion, literally, of her name that became this horror story of Lucy Long Night. And um, if you sniff around online, you can find paintings of Lucy Long Night. It's spelled L-U-S-S-I. And um, just of animals running wild and houses on fire and, and just terror that this, this poor woman is, is wreaking havoc, even though she was actually a victim. And um, now the places that actually believe in St. Lucia instead of Lucy Long Night have a much tamer tradition of uh, children um, wearing wreaths on their heads and baking saffron buns for breakfast. Um, it's a little different way to for December 13th to go than um, shrieking banshees and um, stampeding animals. And um, Scott, you were talking about the, the, the Nis um, and it uh, accompanies her. And if you're nice to it, it's okay with you. But if you're not nice to it, um, it will also wreak havoc on you and um, inflict terror on your animals. So that's the Lucy Long Night story. You can buy them, Nisa and Tompkins, some, some places, supposedly. Yeah. It'd be nice. Nice to have a little house sprite. <laughs> Unless you get it on Lucy Long Night, then maybe not. Yeah. What part of the country is that from? That sounds like some sort of Celtic. The story actually started in Italy. She was Italy. Italian, okay. Lucia. Lucia um, yeah. But in, in Italy, it wasn't Lucy Long Night. It was St. Lucia. As it traveled across to other parts of Europe, it, that's when it became Lucy. Okay. <laughs> she became a monster instead of a saint. <laughs> <laughs> that's what she gets for saying she'll do good for her whole life. <laughs> right? That's what you get for being a good person. <laughs> and then she inspired the Peanuts character. <laughs> yeah maybe yeah maybe <laughs> do you know anything about that uh where, where is it I, this is way off topic but the okay the log that craps presents what is that oh one? the tio de nadal i do know about that <laughs> <laughs> that'll be a fun one to bring up at the end yeah i do know about the tio de nadal i don't know any of the songs so i can't ah, sing for you shoot <laughs> trust I mean, me you I... don't want that anyway you don't want where me to is sing that? for you that's in Spain. uh 
which part of Spain though? It starts with a C. Uh, oh, Catalina. It. Catalina, there we go. The Catalina and crap and Christmas log. That's Perfect. right. It's the fucking Catalina present shitting log. You should look that up, Jeremy. You'll find a, that'll be your new tradition with your kids. I guarantee it. No, <laughs> my, 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 my... They're so cute. If you see what they look like, they're adorable. I couldn't imagine beating it with a stick. They're so cute. I mean, my, my, new, my, new, my new tradition for my kids is I go into the room and I sing that TikTok song, you ain't getting shit for Christmas. Because I mean, yeah. <laughs> You yeah. haven't cleaned your room all year. Still got a box of Yule Lads before uh, Christmas is coming. Hard staying up. Hard staying up. <laughs> so where would you like to go next um, Debra you pick oh I have what, no I don't know I'm just listening I'm listening and learning here <laughs> I've got I've got Christmas vampires I've got Christmas oh, oh, no. vampires I love them oh okay yeah, I was gonna say, well, was gonna say Debra's got a thing for Dracula so. I do I do that's yeah let's well these that. are not suave vampires <laughs> these are not posh um, these are the Calicanzaros. The Calicanzaros are the Greek Christmas vampires. And um, now what they look like is, is really up for debate. Um, some people say they're like taller than a house. Other people say they're super small, like only up to your waist. But the tragic part is that anybody uh, born between the 25th and January 6th, which is the epiphany, is doomed to become a Calicanzaros. So just uh, like the the werewolves, just like the werewolves. Yep, I, there's where, there's always overlap in these stories. Where do they differ? Which which regions are the, those two stories differing from? The werewolves are much further north, and uh, this was along the uh, coast of the Mediterranean. Okay, so think Cyprus, Greece, places like that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Come on, Scott. They, the vampires actually, are going to live where no one else can afford to because they've been around <laughs> forever with the money. <laughs> but, you know, they also have totally different habits. So um, the Kelly Kanzaros have some very unusual features um, that differ from the traditional vampire story. So if you're concerned about Kelly Kanzaros coming into your home, there are ways you can distract them. Um, allegedly, if you fill your fireplace for each night of the 12 nights of Christmas with stinky shoes and burn them, they won't come in because they'll just be so revolted by the smell. So that's one way to keep your family safe. That um, seems weak. A vampire just turned off by a shoe smell. I, you know, <laughs> waste a ton maybe, of money and have to smell that crap for twelve nights. Right? Uh, maybe they are posh. Maybe I was mistaken about that. <laughs> um, they're like, we're too posh for that. But you know, allegedly the Calicanzaros are also junkies for sausage. So if you also want to um, prevent them from coming in, you have to purchase enough sausage to feed them all of those nights and uh, leave it where they'll find it and gorge themselves so that they don't come in and bite you and drink your blood and eat your children. Um, allegedly, they would also come in and just literally wreck your house, like just trash the place as well. Um, I guess just for good measure, I don't know. And um, they, they are known, of course, to eat bad kids, just like all of these monsters seem to want to do. <laughs> and then the other thing that's really interesting about the Cali Canzaros is they like to go after adulterers. So huh. um, in the stories I found, they will wait outside of your home if you are an adulterer and they'll, they'll be perched above your door. And when you go out to sneak out at night to go see your lover and cheat on your partner, they will leap onto your shoulders, dig their claws literally into your, your shoulder, like their body, and then perch on you and force you to run all night long while they're bleeding you out to punish you. So they apparently do this either until sunrise when they have to go in or until you pass out, whichever happens first. So that okay, is one well, of the, the unique pieces about the Cali Canzaros. One, screw the kids. I'll eat the damn sausage. They got the kids. No, that's what I was thinking too. Like the sausage sounds a lot better than cookies, right? I mean, <laughs> you like, gotta leave an empty uh, plate. Like I like the sausage uh, idea. Maybe some I'm German. And crackers. Uh, seriously, I'm German. I'll eat twelve days of sausage. I don't care. <laughs> I will be right back. You guys keep going. 
score. But yeah, I, I, um, I've always found the Cali Kenzars to be unique and different. They were on Grimm, and um, H.P. Lovecraft included them in the story Whisperer in the Darkness. So they've they've gotten a little bit of a uh, press over time. The wait, they were on Grimm. They were. I don't they remember were. that one. Well, you'll I have mean, to watch been, them all again and find it. Uh, yeah, that ain't <laughs> happening. But I mean, it's it's been a long time. But I don't remember them. Being it's been on a Grimm. long time for me too. Yeah. I mean, Grimm uh, ended like five six years ago. I like it that did. the uh, the adulterers have to come home and explain those scratches on their back. <laughs> right. Right. And why they've been bled out all night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially because I'm sure everybody in the region knows the story of the Kelly Canzados. So they probably are like, uh-huh. Got it. Like they just, they just randomly attacked you. <laughs> you, you call, you call your mistress what you want to call her now, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, the other piece of that legend is that, um, just children born then, like I said, are doomed to become these vampire creatures. And um, the other thing that, you know, is sometimes done is they dress their babies in garlic to try to stop them from turning into them as adults. Does that work? I, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you that. But um, that is one of the legends. And I don't know if... I don't know if that's the origin of the garlic or not, because um, they do predate the writing of Dracula. So, mm. don't, doesn't a lot of sausage have garlic in it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I would imagine so. Uh, but again, that was a way to that was another one of those preserved meats that um, pre refrigeration. So yeah, I mean, garlic was an antibacterial, antifungal herb. So yeah, they definitely would have used it in anything they could to preserve it more. So interesting that they like to eat garlic sausage or sausages then, right? <laughs> you know, I didn't say these legends were perfect, <laughs> but um, yeah, they are interesting. And you know, that seems like a perfect segue into the werewolves since um, they it's the same and beginning related. story. Yeah, the same beginning story. Um, this one is again the birth on christmas day um is in fact why uh, somebody becomes a werewolf now that is um that is not the only origin story of a werewolf i'm sure you know that but um some say that a werewolf is um created by putting on a particular garment or by a witch making someone that way or a shaman or whatever but um one we of the origin the stories valentine's day i've got a pagan we can bring on that'll talk about lupercalia perfect it's a whole perfect. valentine's day story there but yeah the christmas werewolf um there is in fact a movie from 1961 called the curse of the werewolf and it's about a woman who has a son on christmas day and uh, his name is leon and um it, it is a sad story um she dies but just before she passes um and before he even has his first transformation, um, a nurse in the hospital tells her that Jesus was so insulted that um, her son was born on his birth date, that um, her son will be cursed to be a werewolf. Now, uh, my understanding of Jesus was that he was a somewhat benevolent and kind figure. <laughs> so the whole um, offended to share a birth date thing doesn't really track for me, but um, that is the, the legend that is told in the movie. Um, you can still find it floating around sometimes, 1961, Curse of the Werewolf. And um, predating that movie, though, many Scandinavian countries, it was the same legend. If you're born on Christmas Day, you will become a werewolf. And um, to cleanse you, um, you could uh, take your children and use fire or hot metal, probably iron, to um, scald their nails and toenails, and that might um, get the evil curse off of them, um, or just scar them for life. I don't know which. And um, the other uh, piece of this is that in some parts of Prussia, Lithuania, werewolves were said to gather on Christmas, including during the day, to do like, you know, werewolf stuff. And uh, they, I'm going to directly quote my source, they would rage with wondrous ferocity against humanity on Christmas Day. Um, they would roam the woods and besiege with atrocity. 
and devour all human beings or animals they cross paths with. So um, Christmas is apparently a great day to be a werewolf if, you know, <laughs> you're on the well, prowl as one. I feel like every day would be a great day to be a werewolf, but okay. <laughs> well, if you're I in mean, Lithuania, you want to be a werewolf on Christmas Day so that you can rage with great ferocity. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll be a dog, man. I'm good. <laughs> hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down there, Deborah. You can't um, get too crazy. <laughs> it's straight water there. I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, Deborah's fun. Deborah's fun when she gets in her wine. Thank you. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, that was a you good one alone. episode, and then she never did it again. <laughs> so there's another werewolf that likes to uh, come out, and uh, Jeremy, I remember talking with you about this one before um, on Christmas, and that is the Rugaru in Louisiana. Um, allegedly, he will travel through the air with Pierre Noel in the flying canoe pulled by eight tiny alligators. And, um, you know, I'm really kicking myself. I saw a card on Etsy that illustrated this and I didn't buy it. And of course, when I went back, it was gone um, and they did not restock, unfortunately. Got my but alligator was... Christmas ornament if you want me to bring it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it, is yeah. Etsy, it is Etsy, so by the time you got it, it might be like February, but... Oh, I don't care. I definitely hold on to it for the future. But, um, I mean, for a moment like right now, it would have been great to share and say, look, here he is, the Rugaru with Pierre Noel and their eight flying alligators. But, um, I mean, this is definitely a, a legend that came from Europe with the French who settled in Louisiana, and they, uh, they just sort of made this um, story... American. Um, so the Rugaru apparently does like to punish bad children all the time. Um, he doesn't just show up on Christmas to do so, but in the same way that, you know, the Krampus or the Belsnickel or any of the other Christmas monsters uh, will sometimes travel with St. Nicholas or Father Christmas. This guy likes to do that too. He's like, hey, why not? You know, I'm, I'm getting great access to these bad kids. Just going to get right on board with it immediately. So um, that is and a free uh, cookies, right? He's he's gonna gorge himself on cookies too. <laughs> exactly, free cookies, right? He has to fly around in a canoe pulled by eight magical alligators. So yeah, I I, I would I would go for it. It sounds like fun. Unless it, unless you crash and then the alligators have nothing to eat but you, then yeah, <laughs> but well, dude, eight eight magical alligators. If worse came to worse, you could still open up a side of the road attraction wrestling magical alligators Seriously. so just and also i mean if you're the rugaru would you even be worried about the alligators true oh i mean eight alligators versus the rugaru my mind's still in the alligators just saying yeah they can get pretty big R rugaru's, <laughs> have four, rugaru's have four limbs it, it only true. takes four alligators to bite those limbs off so i mean what are the other four going to do just chew on its face they could the, eat Pierre Noel, I suppose. Rougarou's got to <laughs> play it smart. You know, you got to stay on land, not in sprinting distance. Tire them out one at a time. Might happen. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or just run up a tree. True. Well, you said there alligators were magical can't... alligators. Can they climb? Oh, that's right. They could Come fly. On that would work. <laughs> You're so right. I I overlooked that Ooh. fact. They could fly. I mean... The, the idea of that freaks me out as much as that picture on Facebook of like a shark in the middle of the woods in Ohio or Wyoming, wherever the hell it is. <laughs> Just on the ground? Yeah, I haven't seen uh, that. Floating through the air. Because, oh, like, yeah, I, 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 I think it's Kentucky because there's a map of shark attacks in the United States and, like, Kentucky has, like, one. <laughs> I think it was one of your bull sharks there, Scott. But still. Yeah, buddy, if you listened to last week's episode, I was there. Everywhere. They're everywhere. <laughs> that is There's scary. A body of water. There's a bull shark in it, or the possibility. On the golf courses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, those are alligators. That. Well, that no, oh, yeah, no, no, that no, no. In Australia, oh, yeah. they had yeah. uh, bull sharks in the freshwater lake on the oh, golf wow. course. Huh. Oh yeah. Yeah, they can live. The loser, the loser of this hole, has to go jump in for a swim. 
I would love, <laughs> I would love to release them into my fishing lake, man. Biggest freshwater, man, non man made fishing <laughs> lake in Western America. Just catch me some bull sharks in the kayak. <laughs> that would be fun. And that's well, the name of the new topic. car host. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have any um, Christmas fish stories. That's that's a, that's a gap in my knowledge, I suppose. We could read the story of Jonah. Well, I mean, <laughs> what, what about the Feast of the Seven Fishes, Christmas Eve? Oh, well, that's true, but that's that's not a monster. Uh, your stomach is the day after, so yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it wasn't scary. I just said it wasn't a monster. <laughs> So you do these, you, uh, you actually do speeches or not speeches, but like, uh, presentations, presentations. I do. I do, I do cool. a lot of in-person talks and, um, stand in front of a room full of people and, and tell these stories. What's your favorite That's one you've fun. ever done? My favorite Christmas monster, or my favorite presentation. Like presentation. What was the coolest one you ever did? Hmm. Putting you on the spot. Um, that's a tough question. Um, my favorite one I've ever done is probably the history of uh, Maryland witches. And um, it's actually one of my most popular programs, too. Um, it was featured on uh, WYPR, which is the Maryland NPR station. That's and cool. uh, I spent a long time researching and looking for the uh, people that were accused of witchcraft in colonial Maryland and um, trying to find their stories, who they were, uh, what their lives were like. And um, uh, some of them are uh, silly and then some of them are sad and, and quite dark. And of course, people died. And um, it, it is a really interesting uh, piece of history, a glimpse into a time when uh, superstition and fear kind of ruled the day. But um, yeah, that's probably my favorite one I do. Um, although this year I started doing a one that's just called History of Superstition. And I just, um, I hit um, a few of the major superstitions and break down their history. And I, I think the origin of them is probably lost. But um, it was just interesting how, I mean, you could talk about the, superstition around mirrors or salt for a oh. whole hour by themselves um we, but we did an episode on that a while back actually we did, did superstitions. You? Yeah. but yeah that's it's a fascinating subject and it was amazing to me how many superstitions existed with overlap kind of like these monsters these monsters yeah. all have overlap these these old folklore legends all have overlap and so do so many of the superstitions as well yeah, like you were talking about the number 13 and like you yep. can get back into the Knights Templar and then there's just uh, yep. like never end like But also the uh, the city of different. Constantinople fell in the 13th as well. So like that was like another whole element I I didn't know until I started doing that research. Have you found was it Friday? Any... It was Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. <laughs> but it is I mean it is a, a significant piece of history. Yeah. Do you find a lot of your research or any of your research on like the library of congress and do you know how to search that easier <laughs> i don't um okay. i don't actually i mean some of my research is done online some is done in libraries um and some is done in obscure little historical societies um around the region and um I use all, I get a lot of help when I'm in places like that. I, I usually make appointments. I call in advance. I talk to the librarians. So if I wanted to go to the Library of Congress, I would go and I would make an appointment to talk to a librarian about what I wanted from. Oh, from I was just place. talking about the online website. I have huge right. problems trying to find shit every week. It's not very <laughs> easy. They don't make the search results very easy. So yeah, it takes a long yeah. time. Well, sorry to interrupt. So, yeah, so I'm trying to think, where should we go next? Well, we have to go to Iceland at some point, right? Um, there's so much good stuff there. And I mean, uh, Scott's favorite. Heck yeah. Yeah. Well, you already the mentioned the Yule Lads, there. but um, yeah, we, have, we, have, we have Gryla and the Yule Lads. But let, let's start with her pet. Does Scott, do you have one of those? 
I do not have a Yule cat present. Oh, that's a shame. I think that's the, the place I'll start. That's where I'll, I'll enter this. So um, in Iceland, where it's very cold in the winter, they have a lot of Christmas monsters. And um, the fashion forward one, the one that cares about what you wear, is the Yule cat. <laughs> um, Deborah should be called, paying attention to this. I hope you sometimes will. called the Jola. <laughs> and I hope um, you got it all done. So yeah, Yule cat is huge. Yule cat is um, Gryla's pet cat, um, beloved pet cat. And Yule cat is several stories high. And Yule cat prowls on Christmas night and peeks in people's windows to see if they got new clothes for Christmas. And if you didn't, Yule cat will eat your dinner and then eat you because you're obviously a worthless human being if nobody has presented you with clothing as a gift. So that is what Yule Cat does. And uh, I, I think that um, historically, this is because in Iceland, first of all, like I said, it's, it's very, very cold. And um, everybody was usually presented with something warm. If you worked hard and you were even a half decent person, you got some kind of warm clothing as a gift. And um, it also sort of inspires generosity among people. Um, it, it used to be a very common tradition in Iceland for even employers to give uh, some kind of clothing or a scarf, something to their employees each year. But if you got nothing, you got no clothing, um, it wasn't a sign that you were poor. It was a sign that you were horrible. So um, I heard you'll a just take care of it. story. Let's hear it. I, I would love to. I heard this was the time that the women were supposed to have their spinning done. Uh, Otherwise... see, no, I, I heard that's what uh, Frau Perchta is for. Uh, I don't know. I, I heard Freya would stuff you full of hay if you didn't uh, have your spinning done. But... Right. I've heard that one as well. Yep. Hey, have I mean... you finished your, your spinning, Deborah? I, I'm getting to it later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn creepy cryptid staring in windows. I don't get that shit. Right? But... Yeah, there's a lot of window peeping that goes on with these these creatures. I've I noticed... think all these stories are made by peeping toms. I think they're all made by peeping toms, you know? But... I've noticed grown men don't really have a lot of uh, trouble at Christmas. That's like one of the main, no, isn't that interesting? main stories. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I, think, I, think I love these stories. Were, were, I thought these stories were... Um, some of these stories are a bit... Uh, patriarchal if you will they only go after women and kids pretty yeah, much no, well, just, solid holiday if you ask me <laughs> <laughs> just like most of history scott just like most of history yes point point well taken <laughs> but yeah no i i actually i uh, i do adore yule cat yule cat is a fun figure and uh i also love um you can go online now and see so many drawings and artistic renditions of what people imagine Yule Cat to be. Um, some of the Yule Cats look like just big cuddly house cats, and some of them look just absolutely terrifying. But uh, I, I absolutely love the artist renditions. This is on a question. All the, go ahead. On all, the make, on all the make some good, list, good uh, boneless ribs from your local Chinese place. Oh, no. <laughs> Does... Does like Scandinavia actually have any wild cats in the area? Yeah, Vikings What's, had cats. Did they? Like, because I know Siberia would have a tiger, but I've never really. If, if you play Assassin's Creed Valhalla, they have cats all around the village. So yeah. So just mm -hmm. like little house cats had made their way. Yeah, like like little, little, house, little house, house cats. I mean, like bobcats cats or you know those wild ones. There are. They tamed them. I mean, like the Fisher cats of today, but back then. Okay. Or like, or like, well, not like Fisher cats. Fisher cats are more like rodents, but like, kind of like, yeah, like bigger, like that size, though. Basically. Well, I just know, like, we had we have mountain lions. When I was in California, we had mountain lions and bobcats. Like Brazil has jaguars. Siberia has the big uh, Siberian tiger. I've never heard of like a native Scandinavian cat, so it was just a little weird for that. Oh, house, house cats, are, house cats are everywhere. I mean, they were, yeah. Were. See, I feel like, Since um, Egyptian times, I guess. 
Right. Cats have been with us a long time. They weren't domesticated as early as dogs, but um, they were domesticated a very long time ago. Well, and everybody that, wanted one because they kept your mouse population in check. Yeah. Well, just I mean, like the big scary cat stories, that was mainly like to keep your children safe. You know, you don't want to uh, go walk in the woods because this big monster cat's going to kill you. I didn't know if Scandinavia had any big monster cats. Yeah, I no, don't no. know. Not like know. lions or anything, I don't think. I mean, that's too far north. But yeah, Vikings I... had like house cats, so okay. Yeah, that's. I'm trying to Google it, but that's. It's. It looks like about like house cats, not. Mm -hmm. Not large wild ones. So Just had some big fatties that were eating a bunch cat. of. <laughs> I I mean lynxes maybe maybe they ate some lynxes running around the snow, but. But nothing really the size of Yule cat. I mean, yeah. Cat had a well, pretty significant stature. Oh, yeah. I mean, so. I, yeah. Your cat's a cryptid all its own. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Scott, you're a big fan of, of Gryla and her, her crew. Is her that right? Her boys. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say Not you so actually... Not so much Gryla. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why? Because she ate her husband's? Yeah, I mean, this takes away the whole Christmas story, right? Like, <laughs> where'd the patriarchy go? Yeah, I, like her. She's my girl. I think she's a demon. <laughs> well, or perhaps just an ogress, as the uh, legend goes in Iceland. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, I do do the presents for the kids. Mm -hmm. um, my first kids, I tried doing a Krampus bell. And my middle son went into shock for over an hour. So we're not doing that anymore. So my younger kid gets little uh, little Yule Lad gifts there. No more Krampus. Do you, do you do one for each lad, like for 13 nights? Yep. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah. And I, I write the English names. I don't write the... So crazy. you write names like um, I don't Sausage Swiper and Window yeah, Keeper? That... That one was, we got uh, Sausage Swiper and Skur, Go or Skur Glutton. I think it's supposed to be Skur Goblin. I don't know which website I got this time. Yeah, Skur Gobbler. And then we got Door Sniffer. Door Slammer yep. was last night. Mm-hmm. Go through the whole shooting caboodle. <laughs> That's fun. The kid likes it. It's fun. Yeah, I can see how that might be less terrifying than Krampus. Yeah, so. well, we had the neighbor drop it off, and then, like, I made these bells. I bought these old, old bells off of eBay, and I carved their names into it with Krampus, and I burnt the paper sort of like that, like it looked a lot older than this. I put a lot of time into it, okay? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my middle son freaked out. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> well maybe maybe cryptids aren't everybody's cup of tea <laughs> yeah Cramp lesson hey, learned lesson learned Cramp Krampus is a demon technically he ain't no cryptid right. well I that's just true. made him watch the 2015 Krampus movie oh like that's such a good movie that's before, such a good movie so like... are your kids really little Scott well now he, my uh, middle son's 15 or no, oh, this oh, is 14 oh. and my oldest son's 15 he's turning 16 but this was i was i was imagining little children like three or four no he was like six or seven when i did it <laughs> so my <laughs> my youngest kid now is seven he gets the yule lads Krampus and mistake alert. that's not allowed to stay home alone, alone with the kids anymore <laughs> <laughs> hey my wife didn't think it was a bad idea <laughs> That's awesome. Until Lesson it happens and you get blamed for it. Watches it. <laughs> don't yeah, do exactly. It. Yeah. <laughs> At least don't watch the movie first. Maybe tame down Krampus a little bit. Oh, yeah. that's a good movie though. I got I gotta show my kids that movie. You know, there is a, a children's book called Don't Cuddle the Krampus. Maybe start there. Or you can yeah. throw them right into those B movie Krampus movies. I'm sure my, that's my, true even too. Worse. My kids like Pennywise, so they'll love the Krampus movie. Yeah, then, yeah, your kids are not going to have an issue with that at all. 
No. Uh, but I mean, for if your child's more sensitive, you could try like the the Funko Pop Krampus or something, you know, <laughs> slightly See, less terrifying to bring a demon home. Sensitive. Yeah. Those are the ones you could really have fun with. <laughs> like, my my kids thought Pennywise was a boring ass movie, but when Pennywise <laughs> is directed exactly towards them, that's when they kind of freaked out a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we played it, you know, we had the neighbor knock the door, left packages, and then we were like, huh, I wonder what that is. Why don't you guys go check, kids? And then they see their name there, and that was an expensive night. Oh, no. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> the neighbor's to- like, well, I need like 30 bucks to do this. But Went to the movies, ended up buying early Christmas presents. Aww. <laughs> it was not a good night. So your Krampus, did your Krampus come on December 5th? No, not not at that time. It was like a week before Christmas. Oh, gotcha. Your Krampus was just running a little behind schedule. Yeah, no, this was, was before, before they, I mean, they didn't even have the attention span for all of December to be, you know, he wasn't coming <laughs> on the 5th. <laughs> like spur of the moment, the neighbor dropped it off before he went to work. It's good to go. Oh, well, kudos to you for trying to do something special, you know. Tried. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work. Your your child's just had a little Wednesday Adams, I guess. Yeah. He's uh he's over it now. He's good. Yeah. He's I imagine good. that Wednesday Adams would have probably been like, Krampus is too soft core for me. <laughs> My wife started watching that new one. Uh I watched like one episode with her. Mm-hmm. Which one? A big Adams Family person. Though, the win- so. the oh, new Wednesday, Wednesday Adams oh, by God, Tim Burton on that, Netflix. That's the best show Netflix ever did. Come on, now. I think so too. I loved it. I watch. I don't binge shows, and uh, I I binged that, which the, is probably the, the, the only one this year. It was amazing. The dance scene alone it makes it worth to watch the whole show. I agree. The what the dancing? <laughs> the dancing. Oh, it's Adams Family. There's always dancing of some kind. Yeah. Um, you Whether, know. If you knew like uh, the '80s goth scene, that's what that uh, that's how she choreographed mm-hmm. that. She she watched the old yeah. '80s goth videos and um, pulled I mean, her choreography from that. Christina Ritchie is where I left Wednesday Adam behind. Hey, you know they she's do in this world and out of it together. She's in it, Scott. She's in it. <laughs> she's in it, and she has a big role. Heard she has like a montage or something. I don't, my wife no, she, she has like. a major she's a ma- role. <laughs> she's a major she role. It. Yeah. I don't want to have any spoilers, but she has a major role, and you would not be disappointed if you got to the end. Last time I saw Christina Ritchie in a TV show, it was or a movie, it was Monster. So that's oh, that's a whole nother years or so. That's a whole nother uh, chained up, effed up situation. But yeah, (laughs) no, it's a good movie. I love it. But trust trust me, I do. But it's a Samuel Jackson has a role of a lifetime in that movie. But Shit, but I haven't no. seen that movie. I don't even remember Samuel L. Jackson, man. But no, it, well, we do. Well, yeah. But um, oh, when you're talking about Monster, not um, the other one I'm thinking of. Yeah, Monster's good too. The uh, with uh, Irene... Sh- Charlene Theron. Yeah, how yeah. do you spell it? Fury Road. Yeah. Fury Road. Yeah, it's yeah. about Eileen, whatever her name is, that a uh, female serial killer. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. But. Yeah, watch Wednesday, Scott. Watch it. You'll love it. There's some Christmas Yeah, you won't be favorite. sorry. It's, I said, I've, I've watched an episode. My wife watched it. She's happy. The first I'm episode. We're all happy. You gotta get past. You gotta get past first episode. You gotta get, you gotta get to where. Uh, I think I jumped in the middle, my friend. Oh, uh, you gotta get. You gotta see from the beginning then. But it's amazing. But have you watched anyway, it? I have not. No, I've I've been not watching anything because I'm writing. So I try. Oh. Not- I know, so watch like because you get sucked in, right? Is that whole thing? Right. Yeah. And so, she has yeah. to get an American VPN, so. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So yeah, we're 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 slightly off topic again, but uh, that's okay. Thank Welcome you, Deborah. <laughs> Thank no, you, Deborah. No, nothing to do with Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually we got going talking about Krampus, which is not off topic, really. But um, he is he is definitely the most famous of the Christmas monsters. And um, why do you think that is? 
I actually have a theory, and um, it's not my own theory. I'm not going to take credit for it. Um, I saw a, a PhD talk about Krampus once, and she had a theory, I should say, that it was because when in the Victorian age, when they got really into like the bizarre Christmas cards, mm -hmm. uh, they started finding these old drawings of Krampus that predated the Victorian era. And they started creating Christmas cards with the, the Krampus on. And I have seen some of the old ones from the Victorian times, um, as well, especially when I watched that presentation. And um, he didn't just come and visit the children back then. He also came and visited the ladies. So um, I, I thought that was especially interesting to see these, you know, corseted formal Victorian ladies with Krampus's tongue wrapped around them. But yeah. um, so he had a resurgence during the Victorian era, which is when what we think of as Christmas kind of formed. That's when um, Americans and Europeans embraced Christmas trees, Christmas cards. It's when the Industrial Revolution made ornaments and cards and things like that available. It's also when um, gift giving became commercialized as well. So uh, he was kind of on board with that. And um, as he, he imprinted there, so to speak, and as we, uh, as our culture filtered along, um, he just sort of traveled slowly behind. And now he's having a huge moment globally. Um, there are Krampus knocks so many places now. Um, Baltimore has one, a town called Greenbelt, Maryland has one in Pennsylvania. Jim Thorpe has a whole Krampus festival with a Krampus knock. York has had one for several years. And um, I actually did a podcast with the guy who runs the Baltimore Krampus knock. Yeah. That yeah. Dude, so that dude gets into it, man. That yes. guy's got some costumes. Dude. Yes. So, you know, these, these, some of the, the towns I just mentioned, like Jim Thorpe in Pennsylvania is a tiny town. I don't know if you remember it, Scott, but no. um, they have a big Krampus festival and um, it, it's well attended. It's uh, this little town in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a very charming and beautiful place and full of Krampuses and dark fae walking around. And um, I, I didn't see a Mary Lou there, but it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Uh, the one time I went, there was a green man, um, part of the festivities. Um, just there was Bell Snickel, uh, just everybody hanging out. They're all the Christmas monsters walking around this little mountain town in Pennsylvania. So, Beating the hell out um, of them teenagers. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, I would definitely say that uh, uh, the modern Krampus festival does have its fair share of spanking going on. Um, when I went to the talk about the bell snickel, uh, that bell snickel did not whip anybody. And I, I was walking to the parking lot and I, I overheard two ladies complaining that they did not get whipped by the, uh, the bell snickel. They were hoping that he was going to spank them. <laughs> I was here thinking, wow, ladies, really? <laughs> you went to the wrong monster. You should have gone to Krampus. But um, it is interesting that the preconceived notions people walk into these events with what they're hoping for. They were so. supposed to have one here where I'm at, but then COVID just like killed it. Like the oh, the kid I'm had one that. that had less than 20 in like yeah. 2020, and then it just died with COVID. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully now we can bring it back. Bring it back. Well, you're yeah, putting Scott, together. Go ahead, Jeremy. Scott wants to get spanked by Bell Snickle too. That's why he wants it back so bad, you know. Oh yeah, Bell <laughs> Snickle. Well, you know, putting so together a parade. Jingle in his bells. Right. Um, putting together a parade or a festival or anything like that is a lot of work. So you know, maybe the people just decided they weren't going to do it. Well, they were they were attaching to uh, St. Nicholas Day, and it's uh -huh. like this is Mormon territory, so they have a pretty oh, uh, oh pretty gotcha. small St. Nicholas Day parade as it is. Yeah, but I'm uh, sure. <laughs> you know, bar crawls, beating it's right by a college, beating the shit out mm -hmm. of the college kids. Be fun, right? Thing. Well, you know, speaking of bar crawls, we should talk about the wassail and the marilude. Um, this is actually probably my favorite of the uh, Christmas monsters. The Marilud is the gray mare, and she accompanies wassailers, um, basically people who are dressed up and singing and going door to door. And the wassail is a really old tradition. It comes from the even older tradition of mumming. 
And uh, it was made illegal in a lot of places because mumming got really out of hand, right? So you have people dressing up and singing and roaming the streets and um, expecting to be invited into homes to be fed and given liquor. And this was a common custom around mm. solstices. Was it mumming to do with Halloween originally or around that time? No, it was that winter was solstice. Soling. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Mumming was originally winter solstice, and um, it, it did become more complicated. It would have sword dances, and people started getting injured, and there were deaths and murders and things associated with mumming. Chris and um, Christmas was ahead. like Mardi Gras. It, it was. It went <laughs> yeah, on. It but... went on and on and on, and there was nobody policing it. I mean, uh, I don't so... know about that. That's that sounds like the Amish family babushka right there. It does indeed. <laughs> Dude, like from Saturnalia on, like Christmas was like Mardi Gras. It was like Fat yes, Tuesday. Absolutely. Parades oh, e for a week, e like for e a month. E every holiday should be like that, Scott. We should be having Thanksgiving Day parades with free turkey going everywhere. Like, yeah. Well, Thanksgiving <laughs> we'll get into next year. That's just uh, so FDR could extend the Christmas shopping holiday. Oh, so, yeah, there's a lot of a questionable history around that one. Yeah. But so... So back to the mumming, we, you have um, all of this wildness that goes on with mumming. And in fact, uh, Henry VIII makes it illegal in England. Um, mm -hmm. If you imagine this man wanting to stop people from partying, but, you know, he did. And um, he, he was illegal to mum or to even wear a mask in public under the reign of Henry VIII. In the name so, of Jesus. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, he was the Church of England. It was his own thing. That's because he wanted to get multiple, get rid of multiple wives. So, you know, either way, in the name of Jesus, but his Jesus, not the Catholic yeah, Church. Yeah, not the Catholic Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, he wasn't Bad concerned Jesus. about Catholics. But yeah, that's right. So then um, mumming came with the uh, colonials, and um, even though not all of them, not the Puritans, but uh, mumming was very big in Canada until, unfortunately, a man named Isaac Mercer was killed, and um, it was made illegal And in December of 1860 in Canada. Um, However, it has seen a resurgence as the wassail. Now, the wassail is a similar idea, but uh, not as spooky, um, except for the gray mare, I guess. Um, the wassail, when we say that now, most people think of the, the hot wine punch. Um, it's like usually a red wine with perhaps apple cider or apple juice or hard cider, and it's heated and spiced with mulling spices, uh, cinnamon, cloves, ginger, uh, sometimes orange or lemon. That's what we that's, do. You say wassail that's now. Sounds fucking delicious. It, it's very good. Highly recommend. You can find recipes online and um, they're all similar and I've never had one that was bad. Uh, but now the original wassail punch uh, was a little different. It would have um, ale, curdled cream, raw eggs, cloves, ginger, nutmeg, and probably maple syrup to just sweeten that whole so, concoction up. Did anybody and, get drunk or was this like I, a one I, shot? Or food poisoning? I don't know. Yeah. But um, this was the traditional wassail and it was served in one huge communal bowl. And when you went out wassailing and singing, you carried your own cup with you and you just dipped it into the wassail bowl at each place that you went to. That was the custom. <laughs> so, not sanitary in any way. This is way pre-COVID, right? I definitely <laughs> but, would have pissed in that wassail <laughs> bowl. I'm just saying I would have gotten in my cup and scooped a little farther along, went to the next party. Just saying. Well, you would have been traveling with the skeleton horse called the Marilud. <laughs> And the Marilud was a, a horse's skull that was decorated with ribbons and ornaments or whatever people had. And then the bottom was a gray, like, cloth. So it was very ghostly, a very scary figure. But um, what the Marilud would do is come to your door and challenge you to a battle of rhymes, kind of like the original rap battle. And um, my understanding... Um, from my research is that whoever played the character of the Mari Lude would practice all year so that they never lost a battle of rhymes. They were quicker and more clever than anybody could possibly imagine. Of course, this person's identity was always a secret, right? You never knew who the Mari Lude was because their face was covered by a horse skull. And um, 
the Mari Lud would be led by the wassailers, by the revelers from door to door. Knock on the door, you open it to a skeleton horse and a bunch of people dressed up in their finest clothing singing to you. When the song ends, you have to rhyme against the Mari Lud. And uh, this is a custom that I understand is coming back. I got a text from a friend who was in Knoxville, Tennessee in a bar and somebody dressed as a Mari Lude came in and started rhyming with people. So um, I was just like, of all the places to see a Mari Lude, Knoxville, Tennessee, why not? But well, um, I mean, it's kind of like it, it's kind of like the fighting that Vikings used to do. Like you, fighting you was your, fighting was like the original like rap battles kind of. Mm-hmm. Like Vikings would try to insult each other, like but by robbing each other's like sentences. Mm-hmm. Like it, yeah, very like I, all these stories overlap, right? Yeah. So what part of know? Canada is? Do you have that up by you, Deborah? Like, have you ever seen that? Um, no, I have never. You've never seen a skeleton horse that's telling rhymes. <laughs> well, you Not said yet, it was. I could start so this. popular in Canada, right? Oh no no that was mumming. Um, Wassail oh, came okay, from okay. Wassail came from Britain. It had started in uh, Wales, and it has spread from there. I mean, obviously, if it's in Knoxville, it's it's still on the trail. But um, I, I can't say that there's. Drink. Do you have any <laughs> mumming by you? I'm not that I. You know, if I if somebody came in the bar and was doing mud, I've had too many to notice. <laughs> I don't, not that I've ever recalled. <laughs> we, uh, we found out where Deborah lived and I thought like Canada was like a, a state of America, but apparently it's as big as America. It's bigger. <laughs> in America. It's bigger. Way bigger, yeah. No, I'm it's talking about real America. Size. Come on now. America. Significant size. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, a lot, I, of I, a lot of it's just wood, but you would love it, Scott. Well, that's what the I whole, said, and she was like, "No, there's cities everywhere." The whole, no, the cities. whole what? A lot, a lot of the cities. western, a lot of the western part, like near Alaska, you'd love. Absolutely not, dude. I'm going to Brazil. It's too cold here in Utah. I had to plow <laughs> four could days go to Brazil before work and still go bell snickling. Yeah, see, I just got to learn a new language. <laughs> just you know learn portuguese along the way <laughs> yeah. so yeah while we're in portugal let's hop to spain and we can um talk about your your tio de nadal Ooh. i have no idea what that is you don't you asked me about it tio de nadal <laughs> tio tio de nadal t-i-o oh, 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 oh. we're D-E-N-A-D-A-L. talking about the and log here here we yeah. go yeah gotcha. the tio de nadal so, you gotta speak um, American, Scott. You gotta speak American, Scott. Yeah, American. Well, that's his not name. American. 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 <laughs> but yeah, well, you should call it Tio, which is uncle. And um, it starts on December 8th, which in Spain is the feast of the Immaculate Conception. That is the day you begin feeding your Tio de Nadal. And um, that means that children probably give it a little bit to eat each night. They um, offer it some of their dinner or like, you know, some candy or nuts or something because they want to fatten the Tio Nadal up so that, you know, it's nice and full come Christmas Eve night. Um, Frequently, these logs are decorated and um, they, they usually have on a red hat or a red nose or a red bow tie. That is a traditional way to dress your Tio. And um, after you, you feed it each night on Christmas Eve, you place it into the fireplace and you start to beat it with sticks and sing it to it. There are traditional songs for the teal. Um, I don't know any of them. Uh, so please I don't think she's ask holding me to back. sing. I think <laughs> no, she's trust me, back. You, you don't want that. You don't want me to sing. <laughs> Nobody will ever visit your show <laughs> ever again. <laughs> I'm going to hold off on that. And. Um, for the Tio to actually defecate, however, you have to leave the room for the kids. The kids have to leave the room after they've beaten it and sang to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can go online, by the way, and find these songs if you wish to uh, sing them yourself. Oh, there's but, uh, tons of YouTube videos. This has got to be the best Christmas tradition next to Mr. Hanky, the Christmas poo. Oh, well, I, I just I, feel like I just found my action figure of that. Yeah, it's it's a related Christmas tradition, really. Yeah. yeah. So, 
like I said, yes. they just keep evolving. It's the same thing, keeps evolving. But uh, so yeah, when the kids leave the room, uh, the TO will then uh, poop out small presents and candy. Traditionally, there's always a nougat candy that, you know, <laughs> looks like- With some peanuts in it. <laughs> With some peanuts in it, yeah. Yeah, you know- Or corn. Uh, I mean, none yeah. of you might be old enough to remember a movie called Caddyshack, where um, oh god, yeah. <laughs> they clean the pool. You remember? Yeah, they, yeah. It's just chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, the, always the teal has some kind of candy that looks like that. <laughs> but um, so then you know you you have your teal, and then I guess you know after the bird, you can burn it or not. But uh, not all homes anymore have a fire, like a real fireplace. So obviously not everybody burns it. You know, there is the other tradition of the uh, the Christmas pooper. Do you know that one? I don't. I only knew the right. cattle. I mean, that's, that's me after Christmas dinner, I thought, but okay. <laughs> not just you. So this is another Spanish tradition. And um, the Caganeer. Uh, Kenya is a figurine that is put into the nativity of somebody with their pants down taking a crap. <laughs> this, again, is another Spanish tradition. It directly translates to the pooper. And um, they are usually a peasant wearing a red cap with their, literally squatting with their pants down, pooping in the nativity scene. Um, it is my understanding now that um, it's become popular to have all kinds of celebrity figures from that area depicted as the Christmas pooper. Which, um, which part of Spain is this? Same area, same region. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I was giving um, my talk earlier this year, there was a gentleman in the crowd who was so excited when I said this. He's like, oh, oh, my grandmother lives there. And she sent me one of those. Like he had one, not with him, but he had one. So he verified this is true and it is still practiced. And uh, his grandmother thinks they're hilarious and has a bunch of them sitting in her nativity scene with the baby Jesus. <laughs> I have I have an outhouse with Santa in it taking a crap. I mean, I was going to say, Scott, you need one of Donald Trump. Have you seen my, uh, oh, fuck Donald Trump and my <laughs> Christmas nativity. I saved my <laughs> my Christmas tree. I've got uh, a couple Krampuses. I've got my Merle. Did did anybody see that Merle Hallmark? Um, my wife got it for me a couple years you after mean, it came out. You mean Mer Merle from zombie Walking Merle. Dead? Zombie Merle. Yeah, Zombie yeah. Merle. Walking yeah, Dead. Yeah. One. Uh, you got to see my tree, man. My tree's the shit. <laughs> and I have Mister and Mrs. Hanky in the tree. The same. Oh. Do you got the kid with the piece of corn stuck in his head? No, no, I don't got it. just Aww. Mr. and Miss and Mrs. Hanky's bigger because she's a stuffy. Mr. Hanky was like the the old 2004. Yeah, I just I just found my action figure from that day when I was unpacking some boxes that have not been unpacked for the year over a year we lived in this house. But yeah, my Christmas tree is the shit, literally, like your Dio Telemorte. <laughs> You gotta post a picture of it for us. I got yeah, so you definitely need a picture. I'll get a picture right now. You keep <laughs> going on. I take pictures every year. <laughs> Best goddamn Christmas tree this side of the Mississippi. <laughs> so um maybe we should uh wind up our, our time talking about uh Christmas ghosts. Yeah, Ooh. is that cool? Yeah, yeah. Deborah, yeah. Deborah loves ghost stories, so let's go. I also I love a good ghost story, and um, Halloween gets all the uh, ghost story um, fanfare these days. But traditionally, it was a solstice tr tradition. It, I'm sorry, traditionally it was a solstice practice that you would sit around the fire and tell ghost stories and talk about your ancestors because it was the longest night of the year. And it was considered a very thin time between worlds when you could reach your ancestors and when they could come through to you. So um, it is a, a well-known fact that the most famous ghost story in the English language is a Christmas story. And that is Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol from 1864. The Victorians loved ghost stories. Um, the Victorians loved anything spooky. They were, you know, spiritualists, occultists, uh, anything weird, anything scary. They were all about it. They were um, 
sort of a death cult, right, Victorians? So it was very popular to have ghost stories as part of your Victorian Christmas. And like I said earlier, our Christmas is basically a Victorian Christmas that we celebrate now. Um, the family oriented Christmas with a tree and the ornaments and the gifts and cards, that's straight from the Victorians. And um, they would have um, small books that came out or women's magazines and journals that were just packed with ghost stories. Um, it wasn't just Charles Dickens that wrote them. I mean, a lot of people did even like Washington Irvin who brought us the uh, legend of Sleepy Hollow mm -hmm. also wrote Christmas ghost stories. You can still buy collections um, if you hop online and look around of Victorian Christmas stories that are all ghost stories. So if you love a good ghost story, I, I suggest looking for them, they're out there. And so we still tell this Christmas ghost story every year. Um, every English speaking country tells the Christmas Carol over and over and over. Um, we've reinvented it as Scrooge. We've um, reinvented it a million times telling Did the same ghost story. Did you watch the FX story. one? Yes, that is Did you fantastic. like that one? That one's I loved fucking it. good. Yeah. I loved it. That is my favorite telling because I feel like it's the closest to what Dickens would have actually wanted it to be. I got you, uh, know, Dick, you know Dickens wanted to be the Muppets. No <laughs> fucking way, dude. He wrote a I whole don't, don't collection know. <laughs> of ghost stories. Like that's just the only one that we got. But uh yeah. no, the the Jim Carrey one in 3D is friggin' amazing. Yeah. But the FX one is pretty good. Yeah, the FX one is really dark and spooky, like yeah. you would want your ghost story to be. And knowing Victorian lore and history, that's what the Victorians would have probably wanted it to be, too. Well, did I, Ryan Murphy do it? Because I can, I can see it then. <laughs> yeah, you, so. you definitely have to check out the Weird Christmas podcast, because that's like, they he has a whole episode every year on mm -hmm. old ghost stories that are told. Oh, that's great. It's that's fucking, great. It's amazing, man. I oh, love I definitely those old am going to English ghost stories. Yeah. So yeah, the Victorian tradition was to um, sit around on Christmas Eve and read ghost stories by the fire. So that uh, that's how you would pass the evening. And I I think it's also fascinating. Iceland has a a reading tradition for Christmas Eve as well. So it's like I said, everything just seems to circulate and become the same over and over. The whole reading of stories on Christmas Eve um, is not a new thing. And not, nowadays we tell them that the night before Christmas, traditionally in America, um, which isn't really a ghost story. Um, it isn't even that old of a story, really. And we but, don't uh, know if he actually wrote it or just took credit for it. <laughs> that's true. So that does have its own little, you know, darkness to it. It's own little swath of mystery. But um but yeah, I uh, I actually love the Victorian ghost story tradition. Um, I think it's a good one. And it, it kind of makes sense to pay reverence on a holiday like this to those who've come before in one way or another, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, Thanks. even with, with Yule, like uh, mm -hmm. that's how we got the Christmas tree, right? Is everything was dead so they would cut these evergreens and bring evergreens them to the house. yeah yeah and like i'm sure the i'm sure the vikings were telling ghost stories too right? mm -hmm. i mean that's i'm sure lore. oh I'm they sure. did yeah Dr stories of draggers did you know draggers. that an early um the early uh, Pennsylvania dutch when they started doing christmas trees would hang them upside down on the rafters I didn't know my my yeah. family were Pennsylvania and Irish mm -hmm. and m like my grandmother was made to speak English mm -hmm. like she had to lose that fucking <laughs> lose that accent quick the accent, fast and yeah. in a hurry so, yeah yeah, it's, yeah we didn't go off into our own little Amish crowd <laughs> we became American really quick well, the early Christmas ornaments before they started mass producing them were usually food. Um, mm -hmm. People would dry apple slices or bake cookies till they got very hard or string up berries. And if you left a tree like that on the ground, you would get all kinds of pests. So uh, wildlife would come in and, and eat your Christmas. So um, they started hanging them upside down on the rafters 
and decorated them that way so that uh, they would be safe from wildlife, basically. I've, I've never heard that. I know that they, I think yeah. it was four or five years ago, they started making Christmas trees upside down. Like as a and pad, you could yeah, buy them at like Walmart and shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, never took But it's off. actually an old <laughs> tradition and it just, it simply had a practical background. So are you Pennsylvanian Dutch then, or are you? I am not. No. I'm just. Uh, I'm just a good student. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, no, man. Right. There's so much to learn about Christmas. Mm -hmm. It's oh. it's definitely a, a topic that's like flush with with tradition and lore and history. And and see, Rissa, you were worried we couldn't hit two hours of this. And I know we just we just flowed right through. We sure did. <laughs> I, am, I I I didn't even go get another cup of tea, which is amazing. <laughs> well, I hope we bring back the Christmas, like a whole week of, or you know, all the partying and you know, all the bad like Mardi Gras type activities. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's is that your tree, Scott? That is my tree, my friend. Oh my goodness! There's Santa. There's Santa yeah. taking a crap. We got ice <laughs> Krampus. Some little Dio de la Morte, another Krampus there, Mr. Hankey. There's multiple angles, but uh, hey, I have some of these extra books. I found these in a storage shed. If you want me to send you some, I had like three copies and I sent some to the weird Christmas, but uh, they're full, like they have the Dickens book in there. Oh, that's amazing. Um, they're pretty old. Uh, yeah. There's another one, Jolly Saint Nick. Oh, that's but gorgeous. But if you want any of those to use for your deal or Presentations whatever. Presentations and talks. I would love that. That's an amazing offer. Yeah, no, just send me over a P.O. box or whatever you want sent to. I can okay. send you a couple because I, I got like three of each and I sent some to the Christmas guy. I sent a couple to the other people that were in the group, but I've still got extras. Awesome. I would be super grateful. Thank you. Cool oh. shit you find in storage sheds. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, um, there was a fantastic version or um, um, episode of Cabinet of Curiosity based in a, a storage shed. Did you see it on Netflix? I didn't, man. I stopped. I before. did. I Wait, a minute, on Netflix, you mean lore, right? Cabinets of Curiosities. Yeah, that Netflix. was. Oh, oh, oh you're you, talking right? about Aaron Mankey. No, you're, you're talking about Guillermo del, Tor del Toro's uh, yep. show. Yeah. Oh, yep. he stole talking... that. No, he yeah he took the title. I mean, Aaron Mankey doesn't own C Cabinet of Curiosities. He started but... the podcast like six, seven years ago. He I don't think you can that... copyright a title. Yeah, you can't copyright like a. Oh, Word fuck that like, dude, man! <laughs> like he stole that shit from him. That's that's kind of fucked up. We can agree. or Netflix I, did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, still but, I mean, it, up. but uh, well, it's about that time that we don't want to keep Rissa that much longer, as we promised her two hours. So, but well, thank you. That's amazing. This is so much yeah. work. It was a hell of a fun it episode. Was... Yeah, it yeah. was great to meet you all and Jeremy to see you again. So right. We are going to stop the episode. Goodbye, everybody. Merry Christmas. We'll see Merry you for Christmas. part two. Merry Christmas. You'll, Watch out for whatever's sticking in your windows. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember not, it's part of the Not me. <laughs> but Definitely. We'll, let you know our new, we'll let you know our New Year episode in the New Year. So. Okay, we're not live streaming.